Y'all hear me? No. I hope all this technology works. <laughs> How many of you knew Edna and Alma Ruth and Ruth Rose who lived in Halstead some 50 years ago? Okay, quite a few of you. So some of this may be old hat to you, but um, we'll see. Today, bird watching has become mainstream. An article in last Sunday's Wichita Eco reported that 47.8 million Americans are bird watchers. 50 years ago, bird watchers were often considered to be a little <coughs> bit eccentric. <laughs> but there were these three ladies in Halstead who spent some time almost every day watching birds. And some people may have thought they were eccentric. <laughs> Edna and Alma Ruth grew up on a farm in northern Abbey County that their parents had bought from the Santa Fe Railroad. Alma was born in 1882, the eighth birth in the family, and uh, Edna was born six years later youngest in the family. Although Edna was younger, she was always the leader and the organizer. They both graduated from Mount Ridge High School. Alma spent a year at Buffalo College, but Edna had no college uh, time. In 1913, their parents moved to Halstead, and these two sisters, now in their 20s and 30s, moved with them. Their mother died in 1922, and their father in 1926. The sisters continued to live together in the large white house with a large yard at the corner of Second and Poplar in Halstead. Edna worked in a hat shop making hats. <laughs> At Christmas time in 1924, a niece, Ruth Rose, came to live with them after a divorce. She brought with her a one-year-old boy, but he died when he was 10 from appendicitis. Ruth Rose became the personal secretary of Dr. Arthur Hertzler at the Halstead Clinic and also worked as a medical librarian. Now these three ladies got the birding bug. <laughs> exactly when and how, I haven't been able to find out. Their nephew, Emery Ruth, suggested that their interest in birds may have grown out of their love of gardening. They were excellent gardeners, and there are many notations in their journals about the vegetables, fruit, and flowers that they grew. However, a love of nature and interest in birds was probably instilled in their childhood on the farm. Edna once wrote, and here I quote, Always nature has been at once stimulating and soothing. My earliest recollections have to do with the song of meadowlarks in the spring, the bouquets of daisies gathered in the same pasture in which we found the nests of pasture birdies, tiny grass-lined cups sunk level with the side, and the song of the lark sparrow. In 1942, 
they began keeping records of the birds they had seen during the day. I first met the roofs in the late 1940s, and they were already dedicated and competent birders. They joined the Kansas Ornithological Society in 1950, the year <coughs> after it was founded. They were always active in the organization, attended most annual meetings, and Edna served on the board of directors for one term. Halstead was a good place to observe birds. It is where the Black Kettle Creek empties into the Little Arkansas River. Now the only woodland in Harvey County before settlement was along the Little River. The smaller creeks, as you see here, the Black Kettle, Emma, Sand Creek, they were all prairie streams, bordered primarily by grassland. So Halstead was originally located on the border between grassland and riparian woods. <coughs> And even in the 1950s, the most mature woodland in the county was along Little, the Little Ark River. For most of their lives, the Roof Sisters did not have a car, so they observed <coughs> birds that visited their yard and took birdie walks along the river and around Halstead. They developed their yard, which we can see part of here, to be attractive to birds. They also recruited friends <coughs> to an interest in birds. Marie Detweiler, the Walton Goods, the Will Steins, Joe Callens, and others. These friends would take them on birding trips in western Harvey County and further afield, as well as to bird meetings. Halstead became the center of bird observation in the county. Edna started a junior Audubon club and took children on birding trips. Edna started the Halstead Christmas Bird Count in 1950, when Newton birders joined in in the early 1960s, it became the Halstead Newton Count. Edna was compiler of this count for 16 years. She was a very strict compiler, demanding details before she would accept records of any rare birds. Every year she wrote an account for the newspaper, detailing the results and telling of adventures in counting birds. By the way, this uh, young girl here sitting to the uh, uh, your left of, of Edna is Maxine Fast. Bruce had another means of transportation, a rowboat. <laughs> and they left to take the friends boating on the river. When they got the boat is not clear. The earliest mention of, the, uh, of boating in their journals was in 1945. But Maxine Fass uh, is sure she went boating with them in the 1930s. During the summer, they often went boating on the river to observe birds. Finally, in 1954, when Edna was 65, she decided she was going to learn to drive. <laughs> and they bought a Ford, which they called Topsy. <laughs> <laughs> then they could take their bird own birding trips in Harvey County and beyond. During the next dozen years, they took at least one longer trip each year, visiting 32 states and driving more than 100,000 miles, mainly to go birding. <laughs> they cultivated friendships with professional ornithologists and birders wherever they went. And they knew a lot of the ornithologists in various universities that uh, they had uh, visited with. 
Edna kept a life list of birds, and uh, uh, the final total, I think, was about 384 species. <coughs> Bruce was the first to observe and record many of the rare species of birds that visit the county. Uh, these are about 12 of those rarities, which uh, uh, there were others that were reported that did not have as good documentation as these, but uh, uh, these I think are probably correct. Uh, in the first uh, column of figures there, I have the years that they saw the bird, and then uh, the next column where it says number seen later, these are the number of times that I have had reports of this bird being seen by someone else after uh, the time when they saw it. So you can see most of these are, have not been seen very often in the county. Let me tell you the story of two of these. A canyon wren visited Halstead in the winter of 1944-45, and possibly the previous two winters. It spent most of its time around the mill that was just back of their yard. They could not identify the bird at first, and simply called it the mill bird. <laughs> the canyon wren had never been uh, reported from Kansas at that time, as it is a resident of the West from eastern Washington and Montana down into Mexico. And since that time, there are only three other records of the Canyon Rim for Kansas, all from western Kansas. However, listen to this description that Edna recorded, or wrote down, and compare it to the picture. It says, Rare Wren at Mill. Wood gray brown on head and back. Spreckles toward tail. <laughs> tail mahogany brown with bars top and underside. Head and shoulders blocky. Beak typical of wren. Light chin, throat, and upper breast. Taking on mahogany tints, full mahogany toward tail. It very well it couldn't be much else. They heard it sing. And uh, one day, they listened to it sing for 53 times. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can get that song. Let me see. <laughs> Edna described the song as an inverted whistle descending. <laughs> I'll listen to it and see if that's a good description. It'll take a minute here, probably. Golden crowned sparrow is a bird that nests from Alaska to northern Washington. 
and winters along the west coast south of Baja California. One visited the roof's yard on May 13, 1957. There's only one other record of this sparrow in Harvey County, a bird seen last year on the Christmas bird count. Here is Edna's description of the bird. The golden crowned sparrow, Zonotrichia coronata, was seen at 5.45 p.m. This is one thing you'll notice in their records. It's always timed. Within 23 feet of our dinette window. <laughs> and then in the parentheses, she says, I measured. <laughs> <laughs> the two broad black stripes on either side of the head made it look as though it wore a turban, which was almost ready to slip over thighs. The central stripe was a good strong yellow, almost half the distance back, distance back, and then clear white, which is probably a better description than this more dramatic picture. The bird was with a white throated sparrow, the golden crown sparrow with a bit larger appearing. I would say more like a white crown, which it closely resembled. They fed on weed seeds. <coughs> Edna was a good writer and published articles in Audubon, Nature Magazine, and the KOS Kansas Ornithological Society Bulletin. In addition, during the 1950s, she often contributed notes from Halstead to the Bulletin, and she contributed bird observations to Audubon Field Notes. Now you'll notice uh, here these uh, articles are very different types. Uh, the ones in Audubon and Nature are mostly uh, geared to the general audience. Uh, the one in the Kansas Ornithological Society Bulletin is a very technical paper based upon her uh, research of all the literature about the bay breasted warbler in Kansas and who has seen it and. Uh, when it was first discovered, and so on. Um, now let's uh, say a little bit about a couple of these articles. The Townsend Solitary is an uncommon winter visitor to Kansas from the Western <coughs> Mountains. They were seen around Halstead in many winters. Edna wrote the article which she called Singer of the Mountains, about their experiences with the visiting solitaire. It was a nice mixture of their experiences watching this uh, solitaire with information gleaned from Edna's reading of the literature on the species. It was published in Audubon magazine, and the editor wrote to her. And here I quote from the letter. We are pleased to inform you that your article on the Townsend Solitaire has evoked many favorable comments. One reader said it was beautifully written and we should have more of the same. We of the editorial department shall look forward to receiving other articles from, from you in the very near future. <laughs> now a few weeks later, Edna, always a stickler for correct details, wrote back asking them to put a correction <laughs> the next issue. Because in the first sentence of the article, they had changed her wording, which was along our little river in Halstead, with little and river not capitalized. They had changed that to along our little Kansas river in Halstead, Kansas and river being capitalized. She pointed out that the Kansas river was in northeast Kansas. <laughs> And the river in Halstead was the Little Arkansas River. Uh, she had a whole page documenting this. <laughs> <laughs> I have the letter up, letter, the letter up here on the display table because it is typical Edna. Edna had a very academic interest, uh, but I think she felt handicapped because of her lack of formal education and. and and uh, degrees. And so she compensated by always being very correct and trying to do things very correctly. Edna 
I also presented a paper at the ninth annual meeting of the Kansas Historical Logical Society in Manhattan on the towns of the solitary in Kansas. She wrote to many people across the state getting all their records and when the towns of the solitary had been seen there. And then she made up this map, which she uh, showed at, at this meeting, showing where it's been seen most often and uh, so on. <clears throat> when an Inca dove, an uncommon visitor from the southwest, visited the yard in the winter of 1951-52, he stayed for 72 days. This is when I knew them and I saw the dove myself. Edna carefully recorded his daily pattern of activity. They also constructed a blind out of a stepladder and canvas, and Al Alma sat in it for hours to try to get a photograph. <laughs> when this didn't work, they constructed another blind out of cardboard boxes. I don't think they ever got a picture. Edna wrote an article that was published in Nature magazine on this visitor and described his behavior and daily activity. Uh, the article concludes after telling of the bird's disappearance, and here I quote, Sometimes in fancy, we still seem to see her with royal dignity, gracefully tilt, lifting her gorgeous maroon-trimmed wings in quick flight. And we marvel that we had not realized all along that we had entertained not a mere bird, but an Inca pr princess in dove disguise. <laughs> Edna also wrote many things that were never published. A manuscript called Boat Burning in Central Kansas was sent to the Reader's Digest, but I don't think it was ever published. It starts out, and here I quote, To bird from a boat, four or five things are essential. A rowboat, of course, binoculars, a quiet, placid stream with no appreciable current, a willingness to put aside the urge for speed, and time to dawdle and enjoy the beauty about you, and count all birds seen but, but an extra bonus, and particularly particularly, not particularly de deserved, but enjoyed as though each were a gift. She tells it in this manuscript with many beautiful incidents, and I'll just quote one other area here. Each trip is a treasure in itself, but to think back, somehow all of the best in each seems part of a whole, and you have a composite which glows and scintillates with each cherished experience the facet of a jewel, each bend and turn brings happy memories. That's the tree in which we had six or seven red stars two years ago this May. This is the steep bank on which we found a rock wren singing. There are the bluffs where we so often lunch. Here we see the last brown thresher in autumn and the first juncos. She also tells the humorous adventures. Here's one. Uh, they often, or they sometimes, in the right season, went uh, on their boat out on the river to both to bird and to collect wild grapes, which they made into gel. So here's what she says. We recall the mental picture of her elderly deaf friend, who not understanding that we were combining birding and grape harvesting, had joined us glove and a cuter complete with hat and veil. <laughs> Backing the boat into position, I glanced over my shoulder and found our friend thoroughly embroiled in the lianas and tendrils of grape. When extricated, the dignified 70 odd year deer gazed reproachfully at us, with one brown eye half hidden by clusters of grapes dangling coyly over the brim of her hat. <laughs> only half sensing the cause of the laughter we tried to stifle 
had her Bacchus-like appearance. <laughs> Just across from this place, we again gathered grapes, and in standing up to reach the high, lovely clusters, the boat listed deeply to one side. And for a moment, it looked as though we'd go over. Pickers, horse glasses, grapes, and all. And yet, we were unable to stop laughing, even had we known we were to drown because of it. <laughs> Here's another incident. A favorite cousin from the West Coast loved our bird outings, but still had not had a good view of the thrush. As our boat approached and was about to pass under a long horizontal branch of willow, I drew her attention to an olive back perched in typical thrush stands in the willow beyond. She, gentle soul as she is, kept murmuring something I did not catch. Still pointing at the thrush, I sternly told her to quit looking at the other birds and concentrate on her thrush. <laughs> Still she murmured uh, her timid plaint. And suddenly I came to with a start and heard her say, but I'm afraid it will fall into the boat. <laughs> Following her gaze, I found she was looking at a snake, its, its <laughs> gone on the limb under which we were about to pass. <laughs> we moved from under and quick. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the manuscript is missing two pages. Uh, page number four ends with these sentences. One of our river incidents, which might have been a tragedy, ended humorously. We never plan boating when the river is up. However, on July 10th, 1950, we had gone to the river, not knowing of the rise. <coughs> we boated to chance it anyway. As we left, pages five and six are missing. <laughs> <laughs> We may never know what happened on this exciting adventure. <laughs> they also wrote reports detailing their activities and everything they learned on their trips around the country. They, of course, detailed all the birds they saw, but they also had other bits of information. And for those of you who are birders, uh, this was. Uh, a new little thing that I gained from Ruth Rose's description of the trip to Washington, D.C., when she attended a medical librarian's conference. Uh, she says, we drove along the Cabin <coughs> John uh, area on the canal to Roger Troy Peterson's house in Glen Echo. It looks very similar to some of the caretakers' um, simple colonial brick houses. He and the missus are in Europe, two boys at home. <coughs> there we looked at a red star's nest and a female red star. Billy Ruck told of her sister living at the edge of the uh, National Cathedral grounds next to Clarence Allen, who devotes all of his time to the Audubon Society activities in Washington, <coughs> and was the painter person responsible for getting Roger Tory Peterson started. The latter, at the age of 15, was getting into trouble with a gang of boys that were not good. And Alan <coughs> took Roger Tory Peterson in tow and started him off on birdie. Roger Tory Peterson came from a poor family and does not have college. At 17, Roger Tory Peterson asked Allen, who is a banker and counselor for a boys' camp in the Berkshires, whether he would be counselor, whether he could be counselor at the camp. Allen advanced his him money for the train fare, but when the boy got there, he did not have other money, so he shouldered his suitcase and hoofed it out to the camp seven miles away. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I didn't know that about Roger Tory Peterson. <laughs> <clears throat> the daily records of birds seen from late 1942 to 1970 are one of the most important contributions of the Roos. 
From 1942 to 1952, the records were kept on calendars, although Ruth Rose later transcribed them into a large notebook. But from 1953 on, they were kept in books. And I've put some examples of some of these up on the display table if you want to look at them afterwards. Now, if you look at them, you'll see that it would be impossible to scan these into the computer. Um, it'd be unreadable. Uh, so I've simply typed into the computer and tried to put it, uh, put them on the page where they would have had them. Um, Edna described why they kept these records. And here I'll quote. In 1942, we drifted into jotting down on the calendar in the kitchen. Whatever birds were seen day to day, day by day, sometimes also noting pertinent data. After reading books by Roger Tory Peterson, Joseph Hickey, etc., and Audubon magazine, I feel this day to day calendar would be of some value as it would be the study of the same locality for a period of time. So they had this idea that, that uh, this might be of use sometime. Here I have transcribed the information from the page for May uh, 22, 1953. You see up there at the top, they've got a little bit about the weather. Uh, they have a trip here that they made to Copes and Thicket. Now, this is another thing you got to uh, do in interpreting this. They've got their own little names for every place they went. And I know where some of them are. Some of them, I, I don't know for sure. I think this is along the, the little river somewhere. They've got the exact time which, which they spent on this trip. And then they've got the birds listed. And then they have a, another category over here which is labeled here. That means it was at their home. These are the birds that came to their yard. And then they got little things about, uh, uh, we trotted round and round for the chat and so on, and the snowy owl in May, that's, that's a strange one. Um, but another thing you'll notice is that not all of these look like the names you're familiar with as the common names of birds. Um, they had their own names for birds. <coughs> this is another thing you have to be able to interpret. Uh, now, and they weren't always consistent. For instance, I think when they come when they talk about Sir and Lady Balti, they were talking about a specific um, male and female Baltimore Oriole, which looked very uh, royal to them that day, or regal. Other times they just call it call them Balti or Baltimore Oriole. Some of these are just short shortening of names: Cardi for Cardinal, Chicks for Black Cat Chickadee. Uh, some of them come from names which. Um, it have been changed since that time. For instance, the Sparrowhawk up there on the uh, top of the right, uh, we now call the American Kestrel, they call it the Sparrowhawk, which was the name at that time. Or the Maryland Yellowthroat down below it, Mary Y.T., that is now known as the Common Yellowthroat. Um, some of them from uh, don't have anything to do with the name, it's just uh, something they thought about the bird. For instance, bully for the house sparrow. <laughs> I don't know what Mr. Merkel has to do with the uh, common grackle. Kitty, you can see. Wheat, of course, is uh, from the call of the great crested flycatcher. It sounds sort of like that. Of course, little Aid would be from Lincoln Sparrow. <laughs> <coughs> One of them that I had a hard time figuring out is this one, Tonker. <laughs> Tonker, what's that? I, for a long time, I didn't know what it was. And then, reading through some of it, all at once I saw yellow-billed cuckoo tonks. And so, yeah, that was it. And then I began to look back, and whenever they said Tonker, then they didn't have yellow-billed cuckoo in the list. And otherwise, they said yellow-billed cuckoo. So the Tonker is the yellow-billed cuckoo. There's still a few that I, I really don't know. Uh, there's one, Scritchy. <coughs> I haven't been able to figure out. I think it's some bird that scratches in the ground. 
um, and maybe it was just that they heard something, but um, I haven't been able to locate it or to identify it with any particular thing. <laughs> when they put down M and F after the bird, then that's male and female, you have to know that. Uh, if they have S, a little S after the bird, that means they heard it sing. Uh, there's all these little things that you got to know in order to interpret. Uh, but uh, work hard enough at it, you can figure it out. Here's the uh, the page for um, April 16, 1960. Now this was after they got their car. So up in the left-hand corner, every day they had the mileage in the morning and the mileage in the evening and the miles in the <laughs> Also, they bought gas that day. Look at the price. Uh, over here, we've got the, the, cardinal, the birds that they saw during the day at their house. Uh, and when there's an A after it, that means almost saw it, the rest of them didn't. And R means the roof saw it, but Edna and Colonel didn't. Uh, when they put X's, it probably means either that it's a very good record, it hasn't been seen very often before, or it's the first record for the year. So it's to, it's to look at that carefully. You can see the house man saying, then over here, you'll notice they said everything they did. So busy, sweep porch, iron one and a half hours, brush him up inside the car. <laughs> and then they hurried to pick up Joe after 4.30 and they went out to the county park, Astler Pond and Burton Lake. Uh, storm was brewing, dust in small areas. And then they gave the list of birds that they saw. And then the last, had a nice time, even if it was nasty like. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the uh, one for June 2nd of 1960. You see uh, the mileage up there also. Uh, you get the, the uh, high for the day. It says high so far. I guess that was the high temperature <laughs> so far that season. Uh, and then there's some little things about the birds, and sometimes they've got even more. But um, the thresher is building in the jasmine, probably building a nest. The eastern kingbird was the tip of the pear tree, crested like it, right out front. Uh, the red belly was at peace. The cardinals fed babies at fill bricks. Uh, and then they had kitty swickers a lot. Now, I don't know what swickers means. Anybody know what swickers means? I don't know. The cat bird did something, but I'm not sure what it was. Also, over here, they document all, all the other things they did during the day. They called them Charles Coffin for an hour and a half. Um, oh, brought a, a vireo to the museum, a Philadelphia vireo. Edna died on her 80th birthday, November 12, 1968. She quit jotting down on her daily bird observations in March of that year, but Ruth Rose and Alma continued the records and even had a short bird list you see on the day that Alma died, where they had to die. Uh, this Who Cooks for You, that's the, the call of the barred owl. So apparently they heard a barred owl, and it's interesting that the uh, at 2.40, which I assume is 2.40 a.m. <laughs> well, I've been calling in the afternoon, but unlikely. And Edna died at 2.15 a.m. Uh, so it's sort of interesting. Um, and down here at the bottom, red and then look like W-L-L-S tomorrow. I don't know what that means at all. <laughs> Uh, Alma and Ruth kept up the daily records through 1969 and for some days in 1970. Alma Ruth and Ruth Rose then both died in 1971. So they kept them up almost to the year they died. Mm 
The roofs were dedicated burgers, but they also had many other interests. Edna's obituary states, and here I quote, she often memorized poems while ironing. <laughs> Her readings were particularly enjoyable, say on a moonlight boating ride while lazily rolling up our little river. <laughs> they also enjoyed music. At age 27, Edna began studying the violin, and she later taught violin students. <laughs> Alma was a church organist for 36 years, and Ruth Rose played piano, flute, and cello. They had a ritual of listening to the Metropolitan Opera on the radio every Saturday afternoon during the opera season, and they attended almost every concert in the area. Edna wrote, our hobbies include music in the home, violin, piano, reed organ, and voice. About a half dozen trips to Wichita or other nearby towns a season to concerts, opera, or ballet keep us happy a long time. <laughs> Ruth Rose wrote about Edna's last days. She says, up till August, she still enjoyed lying on the day bed in the front room and listening to some of her favorites with me at the piano singing. These were ladies of many interests, a threesome with creative curiosity. They enjoyed their activities, and with their dedication and keeping records, they made a contribution to our knowledge of the bird life of Harvey County. Well, that's all I have. Um, if you have some questions, I mean, I'll just try to answer. <coughs> How many different birds, uh, what kind of birds did they record? You mean in, in Halstead? Yeah. How many varieties? I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't counted up as far as Halstead. Edna had 384 species on her life list, but that included birds they had seen on all their trips and so on. Uh, but certainly over 100, I, I don't know for sure. One would actually go through here <laughs> a pile. There's a lot of things in those journals that I, I haven't had time to. Is there a comparison as to how the uh, uh, species listed in these uh, here and what the current, you have a bird count every year. Uh, are there some birds that are not showing this, up anymore? This is what I'm, I'm going to try to do. Uh, in my presentation of the Kansas Ontological Society, I said that I hope in, in future meetings to to look at both my records and their records and sort of see what what changes one could document. Uh, certainly there are some things one can see. Uh, there, are, there are birds that have moved in that we didn't used to have. But there are some that have disappeared. Um, they used to find the burrowing <coughs> owls out around Halstead. Well, I don't think there's any burrowing owls in the county. That's something I hope to do, uh, but it takes a little time. 